Welcome to Rock of Faith. You can watch our services live, view our church calendar with up-to-date announcements, send a prayer request to our prayer team, and watch Dan Bennett's Bible studies. All this and more at roffont.com. The link is in the video description below. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see each one here tonight. We say God bless you. Um, I want to mention the prayer request tonight. I feel like it's important for me to do so. We have lots of prayer requests. And uh, I didn't know it until recently, but uh, we understand that Phyllis, Marilee's daughter, is seriously ill. Seriously ill. And we need to remember Phyllis. And Ronnie, her husband, um, is really concerned for her and says that her health is deteriorating uh, pretty bad. We need to remember Mary Lee and a lot of issues and traveling mercies for them to come back as well. Um, I, I want prayer for my family, not only for Matthew, but my other son Sam is moving down here uh, in December and uh, we're really praying for him and his job as well. He really, he, it's a big step to come from Phoenix to here. They have an office in Irvine, but he wants to be out here by us, so he's going to do that. We need to lift them up. We also know families, uh, four families that lost loved ones through suicide. And we really need to pray for these families. And from our understanding... Um, you can be sick in your head like you can in your body, but from our understanding, these people just went out and committed suicide. And that means permanently lost. And it's really sad for the family. So we really need to lift them up. And Audrey called me and their friend, um, I can't think of his name right now. I think they said his name is Andrew. But he's a guy who helped them for many years in the food program. He passed away. I think she said on Sunday, and they would like to do a memorial service here when they get the ashes back. And Patrick, Patrick, and I knew him, and he talked to me, told me about his heart condition. I think he had a defibrillator in his in his ca chest cavity, so it was he had a serious condition. So we need to remember Patrick and uh, family and all those involved with the food program because they all knew him. Um, trying to remember all the uh, events, and uh, we need to really lift people up. I know so many people, we were talking about it earlier, that have part-time jobs and no benefits. And this, I'm just going to be honest, the Obama health care is a non-health care program because people can't afford the deductions to get the health care. And so you pay money in, but you don't get anything back. And so it's a shame, and I don't know if I said it, but I'll say it again. Um, uh, I found out today that in the elections the last several years that people write in five million times Mickey Mouse, amen, in the presidential election. The last several years, they actually wrote in Mickey Mouse to, for president. And uh, I, uh, I mean, five million people, that's not, I mean, that's not one or two. Five million people were so disgusted in the candidates, they wrote down Mickey Mouse. Amen. So, yeah, yeah, it'd be better. I mean, if we get enough votes, maybe they'll elect Mickey Mouse and he'll get to be president. Amen. <laughs> I hope so. Better than what's out there. And then better than what's out there. Uh, we really we really need to pray, and, and we know families that are really going through it, and I want to lift them up tonight, and I feel sorry for people. And, and when I was coming up, people were hired full-time, and they had benefits. Even if they weren't perfect, they'd get 40 hours a week, and they get some type of health benefits. And today, they don't have that, and we have we need to really pray for people. I mean, I'm burdened tonight for people that need medical care and can't get it. Amen. They need, need some help, and they need it urgently. And so we need to lift up these people, and, and people are moving. People are trying to find a place that they can survive and that sort of thing. 
And so we really need to pray for people. It's urgent that we stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Amen. Um, I don't know how God wants to do it, but I know that prayer is absolutely our lifeline to God. And if we don't pray, then we're not going to get an answer from God. And so we need to really earnestly pray for each and every one and, and, and uplift people. Amen. That they can receive God's blessing. And we may have to do more than, than what we anticipated. We may have to pray longer. We may have to dig deeper. And I said before, but it's becoming more and more reality, pretty soon we're going to be praying over beans and cornbread and being glad we got it. Amen. It's coming up. It's coming down the road. Amen. Uh, and so we really, we really need to pray. And I know for me, over the last eight years, uh, the uh, ability to purchase and buy things has gone way down because everything has gone up and the wages didn't equal that sort of thing. And so it's really a battle. But we really need to pray. God is need, needing to touch people. And I heard a preacher say many years ago, there's something about God that he just won't do anything unless you pray. And so you have to pray if you want God to move on your behalf. Amen. I thank the Lord for his helping us this week. We've had our battles with Matthew and his his dog and his job and, and that sort of thing. And so we want to really pray for him tonight. But there are other people that are battling too, and there are other people that are struggling. And 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 people don't don't understand from my viewpoint as a pastor, if they cannot support the church financially, it makes it much harder for us to pay our bills. And even though we've cut way, way, way back on our, our budget, it still we still owe a lot of money every month and we have to pay these bills. And thank God every month we pay them. And honestly, I don't even know how that gets here, but uh, some way or another, God um, uh, provides for Rock of Faith, and we thank him for it. I don't want to forget either uh, uh, Sister Ruby went down to San Diego. She has family members. They lost a brother, and I think a sister is very ill, one of the two. Anyway, they've got another one, and they bring in, I think the sister passed away, and then the brother is here in San Diego, and they're hoping that they have treatment now that will help him. So we need to remember our sister Ruby, and I believe she's been in, in San Diego all week. All right, anybody else? I think that's all the ones that I got. Anybody else has prayer? We'll be glad to take it to the Lord in prayer. Yeah, yes, Brian. Uh, Sister Lori requested prayer, and also one of Marty's relatives, Sylvester, is in very poor health. They're not expecting him to make it, and they're uh, severely requesting prayer for him. Amen. Uh, she called me as well. I need to go visit him tomorrow. He's in Kaiser Fontana. Margo. Here, Jesus, uh, he becomes really, really wonderful. The whole time, he, you know, we'll be out there and Uh, Linda, Linda has a problem with one of her knees, and it's really a battle for her, and I like prayer for her as well. It's really difficult for her to do all the work she needs to. She has to walk from her car to the office and walk all over the campus, and there's a lot of walking involved, and so... It's a battle. We'll pray for Jane, too. Amen. Um, and, and her knee, it's, it's very difficult um, to get what she needs to done because of that. So we need to really pray for her. Praise the Lord. Anyone else tonight as we're going to prayer? Okay, would you stand with me if you would? And would you turn to your neighbor and tell him, I love you and you can't do nothing about it? Tell him, I love you and you can't do nothing about it. And if you would, repeat after me and say, this is the best day and the best year that I've ever had because Jesus is with me. One more time. This is the best day and the best year that I've ever had because Jesus is with me. Let's give him a clap offering tonight. Amen.
Let's join together tonight. Let's lift up these people. So many need a touch from God. Let's agree together to ask God to bless in our service tonight. Father, we thank you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus for this opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we lift up all of these, that Lord, that are sick in their body. Lord, we lift up Phyllis tonight. God, we ask you to touch Phyllis, Lord, by your spirit. Lord, we ask you to touch all those up in the, bay, in the, in the Washington area. Lord, we ask you to touch our sister Mary Lee. She has a long ride back and keep her safe in all of her business, Lord. We pray that you will touch her and help her and help her to make good decisions, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we lift up Matthew tonight. God, we pray that you'll open a, a good door for uh, his him to get a job, Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you that he got his dog back. Lord, we pray that you'll keep your hand of blessing and safety upon him, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we remember this man uh, almost, Lord. Uh, he needs healing and deliverance in his body. He's in Kaiser. Lord, we lift up the, uh, the Patrick family, Lord. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, the, they, they need a touch, Lord, losing their loved one. Lord, we lift up all of these that have lost loved ones through suicide. God, we're asking you to touch by your mighty power. We pray for all of these on the Obamacare thing that they cannot use their health insurance. And so, God, we're asking you to touch them tonight in the name of Jesus, that they'll be able to use their health insurance, God, some way, somehow. Bless them and help them tonight in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift up all of our friends and family. Lord, urgent needs, people that need jobs. Rianda's looking for a job. Others are looking for better jobs. Lord, we're praying you open the right door and close all the wrong ones. Stir up the gifts of the Spirit and the power of God. Lord, bless your people on tonight, Lord. All those with part-time jobs, Lord, we pray that you will touch them and bless them and open a good door, Father, for a 40-hour-a-week job with benefits. In the name of Jesus, and as we submit to you tonight, we bind every devil, every hindering force in the mighty name of Jesus, and we loose your power and your anointing and blessing in this place. Touched by your mighty power, Lord, and we will thank you and we'll give you the glory for it. We ask these things tonight in your name, the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Let's give him a clap offering tonight, if you would. Well, we're going to be in uh, Revelation chapter 3 tonight, and we're going to talk about the Laodicean church. And most scholars, or I should say maybe many scholars would be a better way to say it, believe that this is the last day church. Amen. Let's, let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to be in your house. And as we share the word of God, Lord, once again, we want people to hear what you have to say about it. And so let the word go forth, let us open our hearts, and we'll give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor. We thank you for keeping us another day. Lord, we made it another day, and we thank you for it. We ask you to bless this word, Lord, and let it sink down deep in our hearts, and we give you the glory, the praise, and the honor. We ask it tonight in your name, the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Let's uh, be in, uh, we're going to go to 14 tonight, Revelation 3 and 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee 
to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesab, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Uh, Verse 20, very famous scripture. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, once again, all of this was written in red, and God is speaking to the church. And as I said earlier, many scholars believe that that these words were written to the last day church. And as we read this, we find that these people were not on fire for God. They went to church, but they had all kinds of money and goods and possessions, and they thought that that was the blessing. But God said it isn't the blessing. You need to counsel of him to buy of him gold tried in the fire. That's faith. That thou mayest be rich. So faith can make you rich. Can get get the job done. Can I get a witness? Amen. Faith can get you where you need to, to go. White raiment is righteousness. Right standing. Right living. Living right in the sight of God. The Bible says that his righteousness is ours, but it's, it's not being put to practice if you live in a sinful way. Can I get a witness? You've got to live right. Amen. And <laughs> it said that, that thou mayest be clothed. And other places in Isaiah, it said you should be clothed with the garments of his salvation. So that includes humility. That includes righteousness. That includes um, uh, the, all the, the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and long-suffering. Hello. It's a, it's a part of the clothing that we're supposed to possess. And these people, all they had was money and possessions. They did not have the other characteristics that God is looking for. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time, but this in here, it talks about character. It's talking about having your character developed by God. And unless you let God develop your character, it says here, as many as he loves, he rebukes. And so if we do not change, if we don't let God develop our character, if we don't become a better person, then we're going to be on the outs with God. But I got to thinking about this this week as I studied it, and, I, and, and I've been really amazed at the fact of how many churches do I know of that they teach gain is godliness? How many churches do I know that only spend maybe an hour in the building once a week? Hello. They don't have time to pray. They don't have time to worship. They do five or ten minutes, they have a short sermon, and they crank them in and they crank them out. And we're talking about where you're going to spend eternity. I'm not talking about, thank God you go to church. Thank God if they sing a song, it'll help you, but it may not get you through your uh, dilemmas and difficulties. We were talking about that earlier, and I believe that we need to increase our time of prayer. We need to increase our time in the presence of an almighty God. I don't know about anybody else. How many people need help tonight? How many people need bills paid or you have an affliction in your body or you've had other things to, to, to be faced with? As I said earlier, I've had more calls this week than I think I've had in a long time. And there's people that are battling things. We have at least... Four uh, families that we know of, they don't attend this church, 
but they lost loved ones through suicide. We know other people that are very, very seriously ill in their bodies, and they're not expected to live or at least not live long. The prognosis is not good. <clears throat> and so in, in our endeavor here as we're reading the Bible, God is speaking to us about the last day church. And today, if you turn on your TV, you will find lots of people telling you that you need money. And very few people, if any, telling you you need to develop your character and increase in your faith and increase in your hope and your love. Um, lots of people I know have no hope. They have no hope whatsoever. These people that committed suicide had lost all hope that any good could come of their life, and so they ended it. Amen. What a terrible way to feel. What a terrible experience to have to be in a place that you feel that there is no hope for your conditions, no hope that your life can change or that God would help you. Amen. And then all of that is truly a lack of prayer, a lack of Bible study, a lack of knowing who Jesus is, a lack of knowing who you are in Christ Jesus. And it is a it is something that all of us can change if you have a a poor conception of yourself. If you read your Bible and start increasing your faith, you'll get a better and better and better uh, uh, perception of who you are in Christ. Uh, there's about 100 or 30 or so expressions in the New Testament that tell us who we are in Christ Jesus. And many people don't know what they say, but they include we are the righteousness of God in Christ that he delivered us from the power of darkness and we're delivered into the kingdom of his dear son. We are in the presence of an almighty God every day, 24 hours a day. He never leaves us or forsakes us. And so we have all these wonderful blessings and promises that God is going to help us with. Amen. If you don't have any of those things, then you're going to be discouraged and you're going to be defeated. But God wants you to be filled with the Spirit, filled with His Word, and encouraged in the fact that even in these last days, there is hope. I didn't get it. one amen on that. Amen. There is hope for us in these last days that God will fight our battle. I preached on Sunday on the fact that God stood up for Israel and fought their battle and in many, many cases, especially in the Old Testament, God fought the battle of Israel. God fought for them. He defeated their enemies. And it takes us, amen, to believe that God will do that for us. That is the biggest, biggest situation in a person's heart and life, that they have to develop their faith to believe that God will do what he said he's going to do. Hello. Hello. God wants us to develop that. We need to have that. Amen. In this expression also, he said that the church was lukewarm. And I want to spend time on this because it's not my de definition of lukewarm that I'm concerned about. It's God's definition of lukewarm. If he thinks I'm lukewarm, then I'm lukewarm. Hello. Hello. It doesn't matter what I think. I might think I'm on fire, but if he thinks I'm lukewarm, I'm lukewarm. So I need to know what is, what is lukewarm. What is God's definition of that? And I certainly don't want to be that. But here, uh, as I said earlier, that God is speaking to the last day church. And if you will turn your TV on and watch Christian programs, you will find a lot of churches that all they teach is gain is godliness and they're as lukewarm as lukewarm can get. There is no development in their Christian life, and they're in danger of the judgment. And God said, I wish you were cold or hot. If you're cold, he can deal with it. Just be cold. Don't go to church. Don't pray, whatever. But don't do it halfway. Don't hit it a lick and expect God to jump off the throne because you prayed for two minutes. Hello. And so get on fire. Get stirred up. This is it. This may be your last chance. Amen. You don't know. Tomorrow you may come across some crazy driver that runs a red light 
and it'll be your last day on the earth. Amen. I don't want tomorrow to be my last day, but if it is, I want, amen, to get prayed up tonight. Amen. We had, um, I wasn't there at the time, but uh, the pastor previously told me of an incident that they had of a man who came to church and the Spirit of God began to deal with him because he was not right with God. And the people urged him to come to the altar, and he did not come. And they prayed, but they, he, he said, I, I have not finished living my life the way I want to live it. I want to have fun and party and do the things I want to do. And so he didn't come out. He didn't come forward. He didn't accept Christ as his Savior. And that night he went out and died. It was his last night. And the pastor told me, that was the saddest funeral that they ever did. It was the saddest one because they knew the man was not saved. They knew that he did not make Jesus the Lord of his life, and he left the earth without salvation. And, of course, we know that when we are not saved, when we die, that we'll spend eternity in the lake of fire. There is no hope. We can't retrieve you. We can't go back and get you. But thank God tonight, if you have a pulse, you can get saved, you can get filled with the Spirit, you can get healed, you can get delivered, and you can get set free because of God's Holy Spirit and His great sacrifice that He made for us. Amen. I find that this is, this is amazing to me that even though people read this scripture, they do not feel that they're lukewarm. And Jesus said, as many as He loves, He rebukes them. And so I've heard people preach on the fact that uh, conviction doesn't come from God. But in reality, God convicts people if they're not doing what they're supposed to. And so conviction should be a part of your life. And I pray, God, tonight that I never lose that aspect of Christianity. If I'm about to do something wrong or I do something wrong, I want conviction to come on my life to let me know you don't want to do that again. You don't want to say that again. You don't want to do those things that would be displeasing to an almighty God. And so I find myself pursuing the idea of I want to do the will of God for my life. Amen. Now, I'm going to share a few things, but it doesn't mean that it's, it's that way in all my life. But when I go to do a funeral, when I preach a church service, when I go to pray for somebody in the hospital, and I get there and I sense the anointing of God, uh, it, there is just nothing like it to know that you're doing what God placed you on the planet for. When I go to help someone and the anointing comes, there's just nothing like it. There's no amount of money, there's no amount of any kind of joy or earthly pleasure that can take the place of that. When you help someone that needs help spiritually, it's such a blessing, and even many times, I don't even, and I'm not aware of the good that I'm doing when I'm helping somebody. Uh, many years ago, I've shared this, but many years ago, I was asked by a mother to take her out to see her son who was in Juvenile Hall. And so we drove out to San Bernardino, and we went to pray for this young man. And I didn't think anything of it because we just we do it all the time. And um, we prayed for this young man, and it's really difficult to be there in places like that. Uh, if you don't believe it, just talk to somebody who's been in jail. Uh, that is not a fun place. Amen. That's not a... Uh, Joyful, joyful, we adore you kind of place. Amen. And um, later on, when he got out of juvenile hall, he came up to me and told me, he said, I will never forget the day that you came to the juvenile hall with my mother and prayed with me. He said, when I think about it, it's just like yesterday that I remember the very thing that you did, everything about the day, it was such a joyful thing for you to come and help me. And it's not a big thing to go and help somebody, but what we do when we're doing the right thing 
The Spirit of God comes upon us, and we make a difference in someone's life. When somebody can remember what you did years ago, and it was just a simple visit or whatever, it's very special. Amen. My boys say the same thing to me. Um, we, uh, when I worked at Ace Hardware, they had the company had bought uh, box seats for various people, visitors, and different things. But they also shared them with people in the in the company. And so on two different occasions, they let us use the box seats, and they had four seats. And I was able to take my three boys to the Dodger game. And they had really good seats right behind the uh, visitor's dugout. Amen. And my boys can tell you, even tonight, everything that took place at the ball game. They can tell you where we ate, what we ate. Every event of that night or those two nights, they can tell you everything. And I didn't think anything about it. We just went to the ball game. But to them, it was absolutely spectacular. They actually went to Dodger Stadium and got to see the Dodgers and on and on and on. And above all things, it was amazing because Fernando Valenzuela pitched both of those games. Amen. And it was really special. He's really a good pitcher. And in those days, he was uh, at his best. And so the Dodgers had won those games. But as, I, as I'm pursuing the Lord, amen, um, I don't know how anybody else feels, but I, I just know too many people that have part-time jobs and no benefits. And I know too many people that struggle every day. And I'm burdened for the fact that they need to be able to get a hold of God and let God do something on their behalf. Prayer can change your situation. I know when my wife and I were first married at times, we didn't have very much money and so we didn't eat meat every day. I don't know where you're at, but we didn't have meat every day. Amen, I'm preaching to me sometime peanut butter and jelly or top ramen or whatever. But I remember a day a lady came by to the house and brought a pot roast. And I mean, that would look like gold. Amen. It looked like gold on a plate. Amen. We didn't get to eat every day meat, but man, that's the best pot roast I ever had in my entire life. Amen. <laughs> I mean, if you don't eat it nowadays, I'm, I'm exempted from eating certain things. And so I don't get to eat them very often, if at all. But I think I had one hamburger this year in the whole entire year. But that is the best hamburger I've ever had in my entire life. That tasted like it was filet mignon. Can I get a witness? Amen. I only get, I only get to do it once in a while. Linda gets after me if I start eating <laughs> bad stuff, and she tells me, you can't eat it. But it's the issue is, the issue is that you appreciate it things when you don't get them very often, when you don't get to do it very often, it's more appreciated, amen, than if you did it every day, amen. And here God is talking to these people. They got satisfied with where they were at. They had money. They were comfortable. Everything was looking good. And God said, you're a bunch of knuckleheads. Hello, you are a bunch of knuckleheads. You got no faith. You got no joy. You got no encouragement. You don't pray for nobody. You don't intercede for nobody. He said, I don't like it, and I wish you were cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm not looking for lukewarm. I guarantee you, if you go eat a half-baked chicken, you will spit it out. If you eat a half-baked anything, you won't like it. If it's half-cooked, I don't care if it's biscuits or chicken or pancakes or anything. If it's half-baked or half-cooked, you will throw it in the trash can, but it needs to be cooked all the way. Can I get a witness? Amen. 
It needs to be done and seasoned properly and done correctly, and then you eat it, you'll like it. Amen. And that's what the church is supposed to get to. Amen. We're supposed to be on fire. We're supposed to be concerned for our brothers and our sisters. We're supposed to pray for people that are in need. We're supposed to intercede for people that are sick and people that are, uh, are need finances and people that are desperate and in trouble. And here we are, we're around people, amen, and some of them, we didn't know it, they're so depressed, they commit suicide. Someone told me tonight that they increased the police around the Golden Gate Bridge, amen, that that's people, so many people been jumping off of there, they're trying to rescue the people so they won't kill themselves, amen. And so they said they're starting to save more and more people from ending their life, from jumping off the bridge. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Think about it. You're living in the book of Revelation. I want you to think about that tonight. You are living in the book of Revelation. You're living in a time where the churches are closing. You're living in a time where people don't even come. You're living in a time where people don't pray. If you get excited, they put you out. If you cry, they put you out. If you do anything out of the ordinary other than sit with your arms folded and staring at people, they put you out of the building. But I'll guarantee you if you're really sick, you need someone to come and lay hands on you. You might go to tears because you're hurting so bad. You want somebody to have some kind of human compassion to lay their hands upon you and pray the prayer of faith and get rid of that sickness, that devil in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I know in my life, I'm glad I got hooked up with Pentecostal people, but some man of God told me once that if I had not got involved with the people that I got involved with, I would have been dead by this time. And I realized that I got to believe in healing in order to get it. I got to believe in miracles in order to get them. I got to believe in the power in order for it to work for me. It doesn't work for me to sit in the pew and not believe in the power. doesn't do me any good to not believe in Jesus, that he'll do things for me. And I've been amazed at how many people I know go to church every day and don't learn anything, or every Sunday. I came across somebody that been in a Pentecostal church for a lot of years, and tonight they go to, oh, I better not say it. I'll, I'll get in trouble to another denomination that doesn't teach the gospel like we do it. And they try to tell me that they're on the same level as we are in their teaching, and I know for a fact they're not. They teach stuff that I learned the first year or two as a Christian, and they don't go any deeper because they don't believe in it. And Paul went to a group of people and told them, I wanted to teach you the meat of the gospel, and I couldn't do it because you only can take milk, so I fed you with milk but you're, you're way back of your faith. You're walking way back of where you should have been. You're walking back because you need a miracle and you're going to need help and you can't do it in a milk state. you got to have me to the gospel. You need to know how to pray the prayer of faith. You need to know how to cast out devils. You need to get rid of the sickness. You need to get rid of things that are hindering you and you can't even blow the fuzz off a peach. Can I get a witness? Amen. You can't pray yourself out of a wet paper bag. That's not the Christianity that God was looking for. Jesus went to Lazarus. He waited four days for the brother to die. Now, why did Jesus do that? What is up with that? (laughs) He wanted to show the glory of God to Mary and Martha and Lazarus, everybody. And he went to them, and he told them, your brother's going to rise again. And, of course, they're like a lot of Christians. Oh, in the last day, he's going to be raised up. Hello? 
Oh, yo, by and by in the, in the blue yonder way out there someday. <laughs> and Jesus is telling them, you don't understand, but today that brother's coming up because I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And Jesus went out there. He wept before he went to the tomb of Lazarus because he couldn't get anybody to believe he was that good. He couldn't get anybody. And he loved Mary and Martha, and he loved Lazarus, and he couldn't get them to believe it. And that's what Revelation is talking about. They got money. They got Cars, they got houses, they got clothes, but they got no faith. They got no joy. They got no power. And it doesn't mean anything to God. If you got a bank account that reaches from here to Tulsa, it's not doing you any good. If you don't have God kind of faith, if you don't have the God kind of love, if you don't have the God kind of friendship, you don't have God. You don't have enough of what you got. Hallelujah. I'm preaching to me, but it's true. And Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus and specifically, specific, he had to do it specifically, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Because if he would have just said, come forth, every dead body in the cemetery and around the world would have had to jump up. Wouldn't that be a scary sight? Amen. Every dead person you ever heard of got up out of the grave. You don't think so? What's going to happen in the last day when Jesus returns? The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Out of the sea, out of the land, every y'all not listen to me. Every dead person, he's gonna give them a brand new body. He is the resurrection and the life. And when he comes back, everybody that's saved and then obedient to God is gonna get a new body and they're gonna be raised from the dead and they're gonna meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. Everybody that's dead. I think about, I got a lot of friends. I'm going to get to meet up with them. Going to be the best day I ever had. Amen. Going to be sad for ungodly people, but it's going to be one happy day for believers. Amen. I'm preaching to me. You know, there's a... <laughs> There's a book I like. I had to read it in high school. And I didn't read it on my own. They made me read it. Hello. It's called A Tale of Two Cities. And it starts out, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. That's the very first sentence in the book. And if you want to read uh, Zechariah 14, I read. we're going to read some more in here in, in, in Revelation later on. But when Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, every wicked person is going to be consumed with the brightness of his coming. Their eyes are going to consume out of their head and their skin is going to consume off their body and they're going to be destroyed by the presence of a holy God. Hello? Peter said that God's not going to destroy the earth by water anymore, but he will do it by fire. And there's going to be a fire. Somebody said, we're going to have a party and shake hands with our friends when we're in hell. I'm telling you, the party's been canceled because of the fire. No party, amen. And I'll guarantee you don't have enough water to put it out anyway. And according to the rich man of Lazarus, he didn't even have one drop of water. And you're not going to put any, any fire out without any water, and especially not with one drop of it. Do you know they had a fire 
uh, many years ago that went over the hills and down around Laguna, went to Laguna and up the coast, clean up the Malibu. And on the news, they said, the fire is so hot that water does not put it out. They cannot stop the fire with water because it will not do it. It does, evaporates. By the time it hits the ground, then the fire just keeps going. And it burned houses down. Even we, we like to visit Laguna when we get a chance, and there is yet houses that burn down that have never been replaced in Laguna. They've never, ever been replaced. A lot of them have. A lot of them haven't. And I'm finding that, you know, we don't, we don't understand what's going on in the world. And I'm trying to get people to understand that revelation is unfolding on a daily basis. Churches are disappearing. People are not going to church. Things that revelation says is happening are happening right now not going to happen down the road. People I, I know read Revelation and they say way back yonder and down the road it's going to happen. And it's happening today. <clears throat> and I don't know when the plagues are going to start, but just two of the plagues in Revelation are going to kill over half the people in the world. I'm telling you, Moses said, Moses said this, not me, when he was at the burning bush and he started talking to God, he said, I did exceedingly fear and quake when he stood before God. When he came into the presence of Almighty God and started talking to him, he said he shook so bad his knees were knocking against one another he said he almost just collapsed talking to God. Hello. When you come into the presence of a God who's holy, who's never sinned, hello, and then you show up. I wish I could get a witness. And I don't care who it is, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I may have not done what you did, but I, I still got to deal with what I did. Hello. And when I come into his presence, I'm sweating right now. When I got to bow my knee and give account, oh, God, I hope everything that I did or I got enough to show, amen, that everything is good or at least enough is good to get me into the kingdom. Because it's not my opinion that it counts. It's God's opinion. And I've had people tell me, oh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I know absolutely everything's okay and that sort of thing. And I know I'm saved too, but I know that i got to go bow my knee and give account of my life to God. I am saved, I am filled with the Spirit, and I believe I'll have a good testimony when I get there, but I still don't get to judge myself. If I get to judge myself, I'm going. If I judge myself, I'm going to make it. If I judge myself... I'm going to get the elite seat. Can I get a witness? Amen. I'm going to rub elbows with Jesus. Amen. But I'm not going to judge myself. It's going to be God. And my seat may be 9,000 rows down the hill. Hello. Jesus said, amen, you ought to take the least seat. Just get yourself in the last seat, and then if somebody bids you to come forward, you get to go forward. I'm preaching to me. <clears throat> I don't know where my seat's going to be, and I'm not going around telling people I'm going to rub elbows. Somebody said to Pastor Dan, and I've heard it too. Somebody said it to me too. They're one of the, the top people in the kingdom of heaven. And I thought, how do you <laughs> Who's taking the election? Who made the election? Amen. Who chose? Amen. Yeah, if I'm not in the top five, I'm in the top one or two. Amen. No, amen. When I go, 
leave the earth and I go to see Jesus, I know my face is going to be on the ground and I'm going to be before the throne of God and like the four and 20 elders, they're going to take their crown off and cast it at the feet of Jesus and tell him, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and glory and honor. Jesus gets the glory, not us. The only way we could be there is through the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. I've been going through this, studying in this book of Revelation, and it scares me of how deep we are in it already. The more I read it, the more I realize, you know what? This 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 is happening now. This isn't going to happen. We're in it right now. Get it, turn your TV on, read these scriptures and watch those people on television. They're doing this stuff right now. They're not going to do it. They're doing it and been doing it for years. If you needed money, God would give you money. Hello? You don't need that. You need a, amen, a character adjustment. As I heard one person say, someone asked him, what does that guy need for Christmas? And the man said, an attitude adjustment. That's what he needs for Christmas. <laughs> amen. Hello? He don't need toys or clothes or whatever. He needs an attitude adjustment. <laughs> I'm preaching to me. Character is necessary in this last day for the church to be pleasing to God. Your bank account doesn't mean nothing to him if you're spoiled rotten. Hello? If you don't, if you're not appreciative of what you got, you need to go home and get appreciative in a, in a minute. I heard a preacher say, <laughs> he's evangelist, and uh, he was riding home in his car, and he had four bald tires. He was just praying, oh, God, I hope I can make it home. And God began to speak to him while he was driving. And he started talking to God, and he said, you know, how I've been doing all your will and this and that. And God began to speak to him. And he said, you, you've been obedient, but you haven't been willing. You're going, but you don't want to go. You're complaining the whole way. This man said, I got willing in 10 seconds. He got attitude adjustment. Can I get a witness? He's he basically, I don't want to do this. I'm complaining about it so hard in labor. Anybody have a prayer like that? God, my life is so hard and so difficult, and everybody's mean to me, and on and on and on. <laughs> everybody's done it. And I, uh, I got to thinking about it, and this man, as he was driving, he said, I got an attitude adjustment in 10 seconds. And he got willing. He got willing. And he began to do things with a right attitude in his heart. And he needed another car, and when he got home, he went to the dealership, and with the help and grace of God, he got himself another car. Got, a, got in a vehicle that would help him get to where he needed to go. But he had an attitude adjustment. He was thankful for the things that he had. Amen. I, I, I shared on Sunday, but I didn't get to say everything that I wanted to say. But I'm thankful for, for where I'm at tonight. I found the Savior that I was looking for. When I got married, I found the wife that I was looking for. When I came to church, this church, I found the church I was looking for. I know I'm doing what God wants me to do. I may not be perfect at it, but I know I'm in the will of God. And I'm thankful. I'm not going to complain about it. And I know people want 
certain things. They want it this way or that way, the other. They want to sing this song instead of that song. They want the building to be perfect. One time we repaired every window in this place, and there was one little chip over on a window, and some lady pointed it out. You didn't fix this little chip. And I thought, woman, you're crazy. We put in, I don't know, $1,200 or more fixing these windows, and you didn't look at one of them that's fixed. You look at a little chip that's not. And you need a magnifying glass to find that. Amen. <laughs> I don't want to be like that. I'll share one story, and, and we're, we're trying to wrap this up right here. When I was a, a young man, my, I, I had a friend whose parents had a catering business. And they went around to, in El Monte, they had a gazillion factories. And so they had a good route they could go to, and they sold their food at, at, at uh, breakfast and lunch and dinner and that sort of thing, break times in the afternoon and morning. And this guy, who was the son of the owner, um, uh, asked uh, his dad for some money. After doing the work, we helped to load the, the truck. Usually they gave us a candy bar or a soda or something to, to do it. But we loaded the truck for the next day. And uh, I think his dad had a 50-cent piece, and he held it out to his son, and his son slapped it out of his father's hand. He didn't, he didn't come up when I did, but anybody, you know, you didn't get spankings for everything, but that kind of behavior did not last too good. Amen. And he got himself a really good spanking for treating that money like he did instead of thanking God for the 50 cents. Amen. He got himself a good spanking. And I think thank you works better than a good spanking. Hello? I used to tell my, my sons they wanted to go do, out, always wanting to do something fun. And I told them once, what you really need is a good spanking. And they said, no, Daddy, we don't need a spanking. I said, yeah, that'll do you more good than going to the park. Oh, no, Daddy, we don't want a spanking. Amen. But the reality of this, it says, if you do not get spanked, you are not one of his children. If you don't ever get corrected, if you don't ever get things straightened out, you don't, you don't get to be a part of his kingdom. And here, this scripture in the third chapter, when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, it's not talking about one thing. So many people use it for salvation. It's talking about all the previous verses that were up there where God is talking to the church. You're not doing what you need to do, and you need to call upon me because I'm knocking on your door, and I want to get things straightened out with you. Hello. God is standing at my heart's door knocking, trying to get me to do things I've never done before, usually because I don't want to go there. I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. Go pray for that person. I ain't going to pray for that person. They're mean as a junkyard dog. They're this, that, and the other. I ain't praying for that person. They're never going to get saved. You don't do it. Got to go pray for them. Go give that person some money. Man, no, my money's hard to earn. It's staying in my pocket. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hard to come by. Can I get a witness? Anybody's money's hard to come by? It is. But somebody needs some help. We need to reach into our pocket and help them out some. We may not be able to, to do everything they need, but we can help them. And I'm finding that that's what this, this revelation's about. There's seven churches, and really none of them's doing all that they're supposed to do for God. Hello? I'm going to share a couple more things, and we're going to pray. I was listening to a man once. He was teaching on this book, The Revelation. And he was saying that he knew everything that this book had to say, Revelation. 
He knew everything about the book of Revelation. And I got to thinking, he would say one thing, and this is what this means, and this is what that means. And I got to thinking, well, what if it doesn't mean that? What if that's not the interpretation? What kind of attitude is it when you think you know more? The Bible says, if you think you know something, let that man know he doesn't know what he ought to know. He doesn't know enough. He only thinks he knows. He doesn't know enough. So if he did, if you read it like I do, every time I read it, I find something more. And I realize I don't know half of what I need to know. I got to keep reading it and praying and ask God, give me understanding. Because I don't know about you, I'm running into problems every single week. This last couple of weeks have been really a challenge for me because me and my family have run into all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and I prefer a nice, fun week, a skip through the woods. I didn't have no kind of skip through the woods. I want you to know this brother was up early in the morning praying in tongues. This brother was praying because my family was in need and I was in need. I was praying. And I don't know how God can fix it, amen. There's a song I like, On My Knees. In one of the verses, I don't know how, but God gives me power when I'm on my knees. I don't know where it comes from, but when I get down on my knees, the Spirit of God begins to move for me. When I get down and humble myself before God and let him know I can't get this done without his help. And when I start praying, the power of God begins to fall. And then I'm able to, to get the job done. Can you say amen? My daughter-in-law is uh, facing a situation. She works for a pharmaceutical place, pharmacy. And her boss sold the company to uh, CVS. And I don't know if she's going to get to keep her job or not. Matthew lost his job. I don't know how many other people have lost theirs. But I, I want to encourage people. And I happened to have lunch with my son James and his wife and his family. We were, got together on Saturday. And I would like to say it would be nice if God would spare me trials and tests, but he doesn't. And so I told my daughter-in-law, I went to my job one day at Kelly Moore, and my boss met me as I was coming up, he coming out. And he handed me a pink slip in my check. He said, we sold the company and you do not have a job. No warning, no in two weeks, no whatever. You are out of here today. You can sign up for unemployment, but you no longer work here. If you don't think that rattles you down to your toes, it does. And so I went to sign up for unemployment. I've told you about it. And this lady read me the right act. You have to do this, that, and the other. And I said, wait a minute. I worked 16 years and I've never claimed unemployment. You owe me something. And she said, I don't owe you nothing. The company don't owe you nothing. This is unemployment insurance. And if you don't do this stuff, we don't pay you nothing. Hello? Man, you talk about an education in five seconds. Amen, I got one. Hello. What a challenge. I had a year, a little over, of learning to trust the Lord, and I found that God would supply my needs according to his riches and glory, and he did. He did do it, and that's why, to me, that was good preparation for today. 
because I never know how many people are going to be here. I never know how much money is going to come. I wish he would just let me know. Hello. Pastor Jesse, this is what's going to happen this week. Hello. <laughs> he don't tell me nothing. Get in there and preach the gospel and shut up. Do your job. <laughs> we're supposed to, we're supposed to believe. We're going to we're going to take time to pray. You do not know how many people I've come across that go to church every week and don't believe what one thing that goes on in the church. They don't trust God. They don't pray. They don't have confidence in him. When they run into trouble, they fall completely to pieces. And they have no, absolute no confidence that God will help them in anything that they do. If they don't have a job, they're not going to get helped. And I thought, what, what have you been doing for the last 20 or 30 years? I know somebody right now, in fact, I know a whole bunch of people that don't go to Pentecostal churches. They go to mainline denominational churches that don't teach hardly anything. And they know that, they knew that stuff the first year or two they were a Christian, and they go somewhere and sit in a pew and learn nothing. When I took the church, I say it all the time, I came across people, they thought I was crazy. You're going to starve to death. Ain't nobody going to help you. If they didn't say it, they looked it. 29 years ago. I'm sure glad I learned some lessons. They may have not learned anything, but I did. I did. I, there's times now I know better. I don't care what comes in the offering. Thank you, Jesus. I know better. Thank you, Jesus. I get 55 phone calls. Thank you, Jesus. Hello. Attitude adjustment. I learned. Thank you, Jesus. I got a pulse. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I still have a family. Thank you, Jesus. My dogs still like me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Beautiful. This is a tough place, but we have instruments and elements and weapons to use that we have yet to use. And it allows us to get through where we need to go. Amen. When I read this, I realize I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to teach gain as godliness. I want people to be provided for, but you really need prayer. You really need to know how to pray and how to worship and how to develop your character. And when you get in a bad way, you don't need to throw yourself on the ground and kick and scream and yell at God. You need to learn how to deal with a hard problem. Amen. That's why a lot of times I'm telling you the truth. I get up early in the morning. I do, early in the morning. Oh, God, here's Jess again. Lord, I need help today. I needed it yesterday, but I need it even more today. Call upon the name of the Lord. My dogs come and lay by me. I think if they could, amen, they pray with me. <laughs> They'll dungle next to me, amen. I'll start praying and interceding before God, and here they come. I still think they know how to pray. They don't speak in tongues, but it's close. Can I get a witness? It's close. <laughs> amen. They are the most amazing thing. My wife came home once. She had a terrible day, absolute terrible day. And she sat down in the chair and just started to weep and sob. And both of the dogs jumped up in her lap and started licking her and, and licking her face and, and trying to comfort her. 
they knew she had a bad day. I don't know what chapter and verse it's in, but those dogs knew she was not doing it well, was not having a good day. And they just kept licking and licking and licking, and finally she said, okay, okay, I'm all right. And do you know she has a pitcher in her office? And there's a man laying on a couch. And there's a dog next to the man. It's a psychology place. And the caption of the, of the cartoon is, my method of treating you is this. I lick and lick and lick your face until you feel better about yourself. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to lick you until you get happy again. When you get happy, then you're, that will be $95. Can I get a witness? Amen. <laughs> or 195 or 595. Amen. We're going to do this tonight. We're going to pray. I want to say it and we're going to close. We, we need to increase in our faith and our prayer and our attitudes have to be adjusted. We need to do that because you need a miracle. And I said it before, you're not too far away. I don't know what your finances are like, but you're not too far away from beans and cornbread or top ramen and water. You're not too far from there. You say, Pastor, it's not good for you. It won't make a difference. If that's all you got, you eat it. When my father came through the Great Depression, he said, we ate everything on the pig except the oink, and if we could have eaten that, eaten that we would have probably would have done that. But that's what we had to eat, so we ate it. If that's all you got to eat, you'll eat it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus for this opportunity to be here tonight. And, Lord, our confidence is in you. We look to you tonight once again to help us as we pursue uh, help and grace through this week, Lord. This is Wednesday, Lord. we got to make it to Sunday. And we're asking you to pour out your spirit upon your people yet again. Lord, help us to worship you and to seek you. And may you bless us, Lord. All the people we prayed for tonight, Lord, let us not forget them, but take them home with us and lift them up and pray for them and let your spirit touch them and bless them. Many people need us. They need us to pray. They're overburdened. They don't have money. They've lost loved ones. They're sick, and they need us to support them. Lord, help us to do so, and we will give you the glory and the praise and the honor. We ask it tonight in your name, the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Anyone tonight need prayer? If you do, would you please come quickly, and we'll take time to pray for you, anybody at all. If you'll come, we'll pray. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to dismiss in a word of prayer. Uh, Sister Carol will be with us on Sunday and Robert in the evening. And pray for Pastor Dan that he can be here on Friday. If there's any way at all, he will be here. So um, if you can make it, amen, uh, it will be a blessing. All of our services will be online. So if you miss one, all you have to do is click on our website, and you'll be able to see us there. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for another wonderful service. We ask you to take us home safely, bring us back safely. Let your spirit prevail for us, O oh God, and we'll give you the glory. Father God, let your spirit touch each one and help us advance in your kingdom. We give you glory, praise, and honor. We ask these things tonight in your name, the name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. God bless you tonight. Greet someone and tell them you're glad they came. Amen. Thank you for watching Rock of Faith. If you liked our service, please like and subscribe to our channel. If you really like our service, share it with a friend or family member. For the latest news and announcements, please go to our website, roffont.com. Our Google Calendar is on the front page. You can find the link in our video description.